Chapter 18 of Dave Dawson on Guadalcanal by Robert Sidney Bowen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dead Wings. For another fifteen minutes, Dawson stuck to the course he was flying and battled desperately with the problem of which of the two bad choices he should make. One moment he was in favor of leading the Zeros as close to Jackson's approximate position as he dared, and then jumping them and shooting them down. But in the next moment he would tell himself that that was like hoping for the moon on a silver platter. And what's more, it was a completely nutty idea, for the very reason that neither Freddy nor he knew the exact location of Jackson's force. They could only figure out approximately where it was. For that reason, they might well stumble on it by accident, and the Japs sighted it just as clearly as they did. And if that should happen, and he should wheel around to shoot them down, they could indeed give him the horse laugh. They had only to bank around and open their throttles wide, and the MK-11 would never catch them in a hundred years. And so with that decided, he would promptly consider the second bad choice, that of leading the Zeros in a direction that wouldn't even come close to the Yankee Aircraft Carrier Task Force, and then sitting down in the water when the fuel was used up. As a matter of fact, the Zeros would be out of fuel long before then, so maybe the choice of leading the Zeros on a crazy wild goose chase out across the vast reaches of the Southwest Pacific was a good one to make. But doggone it, no, Dawson argued with himself. Freddy and I knew something that can mean plenty to Colonel Welsh and Admiral Jackson, and to the forces attacking Guadalcanal, too. We've just got to get that information through, somehow, and that's all there is to it, darn it. Yes, that's all there was to it, darn it, except for one ever-tantalizing word. The word how. How to shake off the trailing Jap Zeros. How to find Jackson's task force, wherever it was. How to do this, and how to do that. Dawson groaned in bitter anguish, and pressed one clenched fist against his forehead, as though in doing so he might force open some little door in his brain and find out all the correct answers. It didn't work out that way, however, and then eventually he felt Freddy Farmer tapping him on the shoulder, and heard his pal's voice in his ear. I say, Dave, old thing, I just thought of something. Maybe we can go these beggars one better, in spite of them, and come out on top, you know. Dave twisted around in the seat and made a little impatient gesture. Then, for cat's sake, spill it, he cried. I've thought my brain ragged, but no soap. Have you really figured up an idea? Shoot it to me quick, pal. It's a wild chance, Dave, but I think we've got to take it, the English youth began. First place, we can't lead these Zeros to Jackson's force. Also, we just can't lead them any old place until we run out of fuel. That would simply be the end of us, and Admiral Jackson would be none the wiser, see? Of course I see, Dawson growled, as the English youth paused for breath. I figured all that out for myself years ago. So what? Have you got anything better? I think so, Freddy came right back at him. Port Moresby in New Guinea, Dave. We still hold Port Moresby. There's a big air base there, and of course a radio station. If we can reach Port Moresby, we can get them to flash what information we know to Admiral Jackson. At least we can give the alarm that Sasebo's force knows of the Guadalcanal attack, and we'll probably try to do something about it. That way, at least, the Guadalcanal forces won't be caught by surprise. Also, they'll be on alert in northern Australia in case Sasebo does go all the way down there. But the big point is, Dave, these Zeros back there couldn't possibly reach Port Moresby with the fuel they carry. Dawson thought that over for a moment or two. Then he nodded his head and grinned at Freddy. Brains! The guy really has got, he cried. Take a bow, Freddy. I think you've hit the solution right on the old head. 
It'll be touch and go, whether even we can reach Port Moresby from here. But it's a cinch those zeros never will. Then, too, when they see us head south, they may think we're heading for Jackson's force and figure that Jackson must be on patrol off the New Guinea coast, which he isn't. Yup, take a bow, Freddy, but it's going to be close, plenty close. Just the same, though, there's another little thing in our favor. The time of day, Freddy. What's that? The English-born air ace echoed and looked puzzled. The time of day, or should I say night, Dave told him, and jerked his head westward. In about an hour, it's going to be plenty dark. If we haven't shaken them off our tails by then, we can certainly do it in the darkness. And who knows, maybe then we can change course again and find Jackson sometime around dawn. There's nine hours gas in this air buggy, at least, so maybe everything will be okie-dokie after all. Well, anyway, turn south, Dave, and let's keep our fingers crossed, Freddy Farmer grunted. Dave winked, gave Freddy the old two-finger V for victory sign, and banked the MK-11 around until he was headed due south. True, his navigation depended only on the compass, and a Japanese compass at that. However, he felt sure that if he kept on heading as he was going now, he would eventually hit some part of the New Guinea coast, and that would be good enough. He'd find Port Moresby soon afterwards, or... Or bust a wing in the attempt, he finished the thought grimly. And so southward went the Mitsubishi MK-11, and southward also trailed the three Jap Zeros, no more than two miles behind, and some four or five thousand feet higher up in the air. And for an hour, the picture remained the same. There was nothing to be seen below but the rolling endless swells of that part of the southwest Pacific. And in the air, the three Jap Zeros tagged doggedly along. Ten thousand times at least, Dawson twisted around for a squint at those trailing Zeros. And ten thousand times, too, he glanced at the last glow of the sun's rays that tinted the western heavens and at the shadows of night racing up out of the east. Soon now, night would come with a rush as it always did in that part of the world. Soon darkness would be all about the MK-11, and he and Freddy Farmer could lose those trailing zeros. Soon. But at that exact moment, he heard Freddy's wild cry of alarm and felt the English youth's fist thump down on his shoulder. Here they come, Dave, Freddy cried. Here come the blighters, blast them. Dawson instantly twisted around in the seat, and just as quickly, cold fear clutched at his heart. It was true enough. The three zeros had suddenly speeded up. But more than that, they were coming down in a dive straight for the MK-11. One look at the way those zeros were piling down, and Dawson knew that one of two guesses was true and possibly both. The Zero pilots had decided that the two youths planned to shake them off in the darkness after leading them astray, or else they figured that the American carrier force was due south, and that they could finish off their unsuspecting victims and use the rest of the gas in their tanks to get back to their own carrier. It was one or the other, and maybe both, but down they came anyway, and a spell of cold, helpless fear was Dawson's. Get set with your rear guns, Freddy, he called out sharply. I should have figured this. Those rats are tired of playing around, and I've got a hunch they're going to do something about it. Something not so good for us. I think so, too, the English youth called back. But let them try it, blast them. Frankly, I'm blessed well fed up with being tagged around. So let the blighters come. We'll fight them if we have to. Jolly well right, we'll fight them. The words that poured from Freddy Farmer's lips were better than a tonic to Dawson. The cold fear left him at once, and instead he was filled with a fierce determination. Right, let those zeros pile down and get tough. He too was fed up with being pushed and shoved and tagged around. Doggone it, it seemed years 
since he had let fly with any bullets at the Japs. The last time had been as the air transport command plane was approaching the Australian coast from India. Heck yes. Since then, they hadn't done a darn thing for their country. On the contrary, they'd been shot up, shot down, and kicked around by the Japs. So okay, if it was to be a scrap, then that would be fine, and nuts to the odds against them. With a silent savage nod for emphasis, Dawson twisted around and squinted at the Jap Zeros for the umpty umpth time. They were down almost on a level with the MK-11, and while two of them remained in wingtip to wingtip formation, the third Zero speeded up and came up abreast of the MK-11. Dawson stared at it narrow-eyed, ready to outmaneuver the Jap if he tried any smart stuff. As it was then, he saw the helmeted figure in the pit put his radio mic to his lips, and motioned with his free hand to Dawson to switch on his receiving set. For a couple of split seconds, the Yankee air ace stared in amazement. Then he snapped out of his trance and impulsively knocked up the switch of his receiving set in the front pit and pulled the earphones down over his head. For a brief instant or two, he heard nothing but the hum of the set warming up and a little blast of static. And then he almost jumped out of the pit with surprise as he clearly heard the voice of the huge Jap who had been their escort back on the enemy carrier. Turn around and come with us, please, came the astonishing demand. Turn around at once and return with us, please, or we will shoot you down into the water. I am warning you, you cannot escape. Turn around and come back with us at once, please. Dawson turned around right enough, his head and not the plane, and he looked at Freddy wide-eyed. Well, what do you know, he cried, and what a hope that guy has. You heard him, Freddy. The English youth nodded and yanked his own headphones off. Jolly well right, I heard the beggar, he cried angrily, and here's our answer to him. Get set, Dave. As Freddy shouted the last, he grabbed his rear guns and fired a defiant burst straight over the wingtips of the Zero. He could very easily have slammed the burst straight into the Zero, but that would have been Jap stuff, and he couldn't bring himself to sink that low, regardless of the seriousness of the situation. "'There's your answer, you dirty blighter,' he howled, as the Jap pilot almost turned his plane inside out in a frantic effort to get away. There's your answer, blast you. The English youth shouted more things, but Dawson didn't wait to listen and admire. He had twisted back front and was sticking the MK-11 through a vicious half-roll to throw off the aim of the two Zero pilots behind, flying wingtip formation. And it was the perfect maneuver in such a case, too, he did throw the two pilots off and caused them to open fire a split second too late so that tracers from their guns cleared the top of the twisting MK-11 by several feet. Catch them, Freddy, catch them, kid, Dawson bellowed as he hauled the wing screaming MK-11 up out of its mad dive. Nail one of the tramps and make it that much less uneven, kid. Maybe the English youth heard and maybe he didn't. Maybe he had that idea all along. At any rate, his guns hammered out their chattering note. And Dawson saw one of the Zeros seem to stagger and stumble in the air. By then, he had brought the MK-11 around and up so that he could bring his own guns to bear. He stabbed the electric trigger button, and a great shout of joy burst from his lips as the staggering Zero suddenly became a ball of fire that hung motionless in midair for a split second and then fell down into the water, leaving behind a trail of oily black smoke. Neither Dave nor Freddy Farmer, however, took time out to watch the Zero flame downward to its finish. They still had a two-to-one fight on their hands and against two planes that could fly rings around their MK-11. They had been lucky and had caught one of the Japs with his flaps down, so to speak, 
but the other two were not going to be so easy. As a matter of fact, it seemed to Dawson that he had hardly slammed a death burst into the first Jap before one of the others was wheeling in at him broadside, despite the withering fire from Freddy Farmer's guns. The MK-11 shook and trembled as it was hit in a dozen different places. And suddenly Dawson felt as though he had been clipped in the chest by the tip of a spinning prop. Every bit of air was knocked out of his lungs, and black and red spots began to whirl and dance around before his eyes. Then suddenly the spots disappeared, and save for a dull ache in his chest, he was all right again. All right? He laughed harshly as that thought flashed through his brain. All right, sure, except for the minor detail that the two Jap Zero pilots were maneuvering about to box the MK-11 in a deadly and fatal crossfire. Yeah, sure, he was okay, save for that minor little detail. Give it to him, Dave. Don't let the blighters get away with it. Fly their confounded wings off, blast them. The words had come from Freddy's lips, but as far as Dave Dawson was concerned, they were just a waste of breath. He was well aware of the two zeros closing in for a crossfire attack, and he was well aware of the fact that he'd have to just about fly the wings off the zeros in order to skip free of this air trap. As a matter of fact, the only thing he could possibly do was to play a long shot, to take one in a million chance, and pray, as he had never before prayed in his life. Take a long shot chance and pray. Hold tight, Freddy, he shouted. I'm going to twist this baby plenty, I. He cut off the rest of what he was shouting because his chest was filled with sharp pains again and his lungs felt as though they were breathing liquid fire. It suddenly seemed to take every ounce of his strength to move the control stick and kick on the rudder. But somehow he managed it and he sent the MK-11 curving upward and around toward the zero on his left. At the same time, Freddy Farmer let fly with his guns at the zero on the right. Dawson's Jap saw him coming, and rather than chance the full fury of the Yank's fire, he pulled off and upward. In the same split second, Dawson steeled himself to the effort, slammed the stick over, booted opposite rudder, and brought the MK-11 around and up in the opposite direction. In other words, he cut off his expected attack on the first zero to cut in up at the zero on the other side. As a result of that double maneuver, which was carried through with split-second accuracy, he not only broke up the two zero plane attack, but forced each Jap pilot to careen upward and away. Too late, the two Japs realized what was going to happen. Instead of both charging straight in on the MK-11, they were both streaking straight at one another. Both Japs saw that a mid-air crash was about to take place, and both frantically tried to swerve off into the clear. And perhaps they might have succeeded if it hadn't been for the deadly aim of Freddy Farmer. The English youth's guns snarled out their song, and one of the Jap pilots was stone dead before he could turn off into the clear. And his failure to do so spilled the beans for the other Jap. He couldn't check his plane in time and flew straight into the other faltering zero. To Dawson's ears and to Freddy Farmer's came the loud crashing sound as the two high-speed planes met about 300 feet above the MK-11. And then the whole sky seemed to be filled with seething flame. Dawson cried out in impulsive alarm and slammed the nose of his two-seater downward. Glancing back up over his shoulder, he saw the mass of exploding flame that enveloped the two zeros. Then there was even a louder explosion, and the air was filled with falling slivers of flame. Choking and gasping from the effort it caused him, Dawson hauled the MK-11 out of its mad dive at about wave crest height and flew level while red and black dots danced around before his eyes again, and dull, 
Throbbing pain flowed through his chest. Nice, Dave, he heard Freddy Farmer calling to him. That was the most perfect maneuver I ever saw. Man, did you fool those two beggars. It was absolutely wonderful. I'll just take half the credit, kid, Dawson forced himself to call back. But for that sweet shooting of yours, the stunt might not have worked. And, oh, for gosh sakes. Dave gasped out the last as he happened to glance at the instrument panel. One of the bursts of bullets from one of the zeros had made a shambles of the instrument board. And the compass in particular was just a heap of junk. With the compass gone, they would have to depend entirely upon celestial navigation. In other words, any hope they might have of continuing on to find Admiral Jackson's task force was completely gone. Because of the milling around in the fight they had, of course, lost all track of their exact position. And they would have to know their position exactly in order to set a true course for the area where they believed the Yank task force to be. And without the aid of the compass, they wouldn't be able to hold a true course, even if they could plot one. And so there was but one thing to do. They could at least tell the direction of south. And somewhere south of them was New Guinea, with the Yank held base at Port Moresby. So south it had to be, and in no other direction. Blaster good shooting, Dave heard Freddy's voice close behind him, and knew that the English youth was looking at what had happened to the compass. Well, south it is then, Dave. It'll be dark in no time, now. And at least we can tell true south from the stars. But after all, we're blasted lucky, so I guess we can't kick much, what? Dawson nodded and dragged air into his lungs. The pain of it caused him to wince slightly, silently. But he managed to speak the words. Go south, I always say, he grunted. But keep the old fingers crossed, Freddy, and don't forget the praying, either. We haven't got the Japs to worry about any more, thank God, but we've got an awful lot of ocean to consider. And yeah, a plane that maybe won't quite make it. Rot, Dave, Freddy snapped at him. You're talking like an old woman. Come off it. We'll make it, you'll see. Blasted. Dave, we've just got to. Check, kid, check, Dawson mumbled. We've just got to make it, and how? And with a half nod for emphasis, he unconsciously put his free hand to his throbbing chest. End of Chapter 18